So if startups were restaurants and product people were cooks, then roadmaps would be the menu. No matter how well dishes are cooked, when menus suck, restaurants close down. This is why roadmaps matter so much. This is why they're the crown jewel of any product-focused company. But in order to have a great menu, you need a sound process to decide what's on it, and most importantly, what's not. As a result, prioritization is a top concern for most product managers. It's by far one of the most popular topics in product management blogs, Q&A sites, and other online communities. Although it's not what we're hired to do, it's something that we have to do in order to achieve our real goal, creating successful products that bring value to the customers and the business. The need to prioritize comes from a very simple fact. We simply don't have enough resources and time to work on everything we can come up with. Thus, we need a process to determine the sets and sequence of things that should be done on the product to deliver most value at each point in time, given our constraints. It's actually such a strong need that a fellow product person uh, built a periodic table of prioritization techniques, uh, which you can find uh, on the blog aptly named foldingburritos.com. However, who here in the audience would say that they delight in the product roadmap process? Quick show of hands. Okay, great. So this talk has a purpose. That's awesome. Draining, mind-numbing, heart-wrenching. These are just a few of the objectives I've heard product people use to describe times when they had to defend their product roadmap proposal. Now, we've all seen bad roadmaps. We personally think bad roadmaps focus solely on solutions and features and ignore problems. Bad roadmaps are decided by the highest paid person's opinion or the loudest shouted person's opinion, who often happens to be, guess what, the product manager. Bad roadmaps are about executing a float plan or, as Eric Ries would call it, achieving failure. Bad roadmaps like alignment between teams. And bad roadmaps don't focus on the right things. Now, let me say we can't be the ones casting the stone here, as we used to be guilty of all of the sins. When I joined Buzu, the product roadmap process looked something like that. Every three months, the whole company would ideate on stuff to do for the next quarter. Hey, what idea have you got? These things would be plotted on a basic impact effort matrix, and the management team would pick a few to do for the next quarter. This process had all of the problems described here. At the end of the process, we used to feel something like that. No matter how good the execution of the projects and feature is, this kind of failure can mean the termination of your team. Worst case, the end of your company. Who knew that writing menus could be so high stake? So we ask, what if there was a recipe built for focus on the right things? What if there was a recipe built for alignment between teams and stakeholders? The one we found allowed us to smash our targets. It's helped our metrics skyrocket. One of our core KPI as a business is conversion to premium, as we are freemium products. We've tripled this conversion rate since January. As all good recipes, ours is not novel. We've taken stuff from great people in and around the profession and concocted a mishmash of design research and business strategy techniques. Now, as a disclaimer, the very same recipe probably won't work for you. It works for our product at our current size and with our organizational design. However, we do believe that the guiding principles behind the current roadmap recipe hold true for any company and product. That's what we wanted to share. Now, this is a simplified, high-level view of a product roadmap process. Who here has read Google Ventures Design Sprint book or blog articles? Quick show of hands. Yeah, good. So our process mapping might be reminiscent, right? We thought that the way they represented their process was awesome. So we decided to steal it. Just like a design sprint, our process has various phases, each one having its own set of activities. At a very high level, observe is about aligning with the company strategy. It's about choosing the right KPIs to focus on and identifying funnel bottlenecks. Observe is about the what. 
understands is about understanding customer problems to solve in order to open up the funnel bottlenecks and move the KPIs we decided to focus on. Understand is about the why. Ideate and decide are about coming up with solutions to solve these problems and prioritizing them against each other. Ideate and decide are about the how. Within each step, there are several activities to carry. Let's go through them. Once again, observe is all about aligning with the company strategy. It's about choosing the right KPIs we want to focus on, and it's about identifying funnel bottlenecks. It's about the what. At the highest level, this means starting from the vision and mission. It's a necessity that your product roadmap is in line with the vision and mission of your company, obviously. Every quarter, we make sure that the stuff we build supports this vision and mission. Yes, we all know that your real numbers will never match your business plan. Nevertheless, we're convinced that you need to have a solid Excel model to understand the growth mechanics of your business. What's the premium conversion rate you need to hit in order to generate X in revenues? What's the maximum cost of acquisition you can pay in order to get a decent payback on your marketing campaigns? How many months do you still have before you crash against the wall or take off? Every company should have a monthly business model for at least the next five years, which gives a solid reflection of the business and update it monthly. Typically, this would be CEO or CFO domain. Our CEO loves Excel. I don't know about you. At Buzu, this model provides the basis for our roadmap planning process. If we know, for example, that we need to hit X in revenues next quarter, we need Y percent premium conversion with Z new users. So what do we need to do to focus on to hit that? Out of the above, we create core themes that will guide us for an entire year. Core themes are more qualitative and could be things like grow international, or crack monetization, and they are developed by the management team in our yearly offsites. Once we know the numbers we need to hit, and the core themes we want to work on, we prioritize our KPIs for that quarter. This prioritization is decided by the management team and becomes strategic guidance for the company. For too long, we've tried to chase too many rabbits at a time where some of them were even running in different directions. For instance, um, in the case of a freemium business model, paid conversion versus retention. A straightforward way to increase conversion in the freemium app is to push monetization more aggressively by locking more features or content. By doing so, however, you will turn off more users more quickly, and this will likely trickle down in a drop in retention. Having a clear priority, for instance, paid conversion over retention, helps tremendously in all product-related discussions and gives the team the laser focus it needs. Back to our very own roadmap, one of the key KPIs we had decided to focus on last quarter was day one to day seven conversion, which means the percentage of users who upgrade to a premium package in the first seven days. And trust me, this is a pretty important KPI for any freemium app. With a clear focus on the right KPIs, we then zoom in to understand the micro-conversion points in the funnel where the leakages occur. Day 7 conversion, for instance, is too big a KPI to investigate. We need to break it down and look at more granular conversion points in the user journey. So we map out the micro-conversion points between each step in the user journey. In the boxes you see on this map, we typically have conversion rates. We then ask, where do the largest drop-offs occur? Is it in the conversion from download to registration? Is it in the start of a learning activity until the end? Is it from the visits of the paywall until the cart or at the end of the shopping cart? Back to our very own roadmap, the day one, day seven paid conversion KPI we had decided to focus on. For this one, one of the main leakage points we had identified on Android last quarter was paywall conversion, which means the percentage of users converting to a premium plan after visiting our paywall. Typically, product managers and data scientists would be carrying this research. Once all drop-off points for a given KPI have been mapped, we're then able to prioritize them against each other based on the impact they have on said KPI and how far they are from the benchmark. With a clear understanding of where we should focus our efforts aligned with the overall company targets, we're finally ready to investigate. The whole point of Observe was to make sure we would be investigating the right things. Again, for those here who have been part of a design sprint, Observe could be reminiscent of the target activity uh, of the first day, where you actually make sure that you're going to spend your whole design sprint working on the right things. 
Those are some of the tools of the trades we might use to get this job done. Now comes the understand step. Understand is about understanding, as the name implies, <laughs> uh, customer problems in order to open up the funnel bottlenecks and move the KPIs we decided to focus on. We've identified the what. We've identified where we had problems converting users. Now we want to understand the why. One thing, for instance, is to understand that card conversion is a main leakage point. Another thing is to understand why this is actually happening. Why are users dropping off at these very points? So the product team dives deep into the drop off points and is tasked with identifying underlying customer problems. This is very important. The primary focus of the roadmap becomes customer problems instead of features. Features, as we'll see later, then only appear as solutions to these customer problems. Unlike in Observe, there's no specific sequence of activities in Understand. Instead, there's a blend of qualitative and quantitative research methods used in parallel. Here are a few activities we might be carrying. Obviously, we'll be targeting this research specifically at users who dropped off at the conversion points we decided to focus on. Now, we also like to validate customer problems found in user interviews, as they can be based on small sample sizes. We usually interview around 40, 60 people for a given leakage point, a few live on the phone, mostly for intercom, extract the top five to 10 most common customer problems identified, and then send a survey to a much larger sample of similar users. This helps make sure that we don't fall for the vocal minority. Back to our very own roadmap, two of the customer problems we had identified for causing low paywall conversion on Android last quarter were one, that many users in emerging markets didn't have a credit card and so couldn't purchase a subscription using iTunes or Google Play, and two, some users weren't sure they'd be able to learn to speak a language fluently by investing their time and money in our premium product, which is a problem as they can only know whether Buzu works after intensive usage. So how do we prove it to them beforehand? As you, like, as you see, we like to frame customer problems in the first person. It simplifies syntax, and it helps create shared understanding. We also like to prioritize, again, these customer problems based on how often they have been mentioned and by how painful they are to our users. Now, as you're probably starting to realize, feature prioritization is really just a part of the prioritization process. First, we prioritize KPIs and related drop-off points against each other, then we prioritize the underlying customer problems. Once we're confident in the set of identified customer problems, we can start thinking about how to solve them. Some of the tools we use, again, to get this job done. What happens next is that we present these customer problems to the whole company. Each team and department holds an ideation session where all team members can contribute ideas to solve these customer problems. This is big. Framing the ideation sessions around customer problems is really good and helps tremendously with alignment. Anyone here who's been to an ideation session where they felt most feature ideas were completely out of sync, for lack of a better word, will understand that. Customer problems become a creative constraint, as our people are now free to ideate in alignment with both the business objectives and our business biggest customer problems. Typical ideation session will go as follows. Customer problems are written as columns, as, uh, columns on the whiteboards. Participants have around 20 minutes to ideate, each on their own and in silence, writing ideas on post-it notes. This is what designers would call the diverging part. Once the time is over, participants stick their idea under the customer problem it's solving. Voting starts then. This is the converging part. Each participant gets a set number of votes. Five tends to be a good number. It's small enough to force hard decisions, big enough to produce patterns. We then ask participants to cast their votes using sticky dots and markers. A participant can choose to put more than one vote on a single thing. If they really like something, they can choose to put all of their votes on it. Very important, we make clear that these votes are non-binding. We want to get ideas from our team and see which way it goes, but prioritization of these ideas will happen later down the line. We now have loads of ideas to solve customer problems previously identified. We also know the ones our team is most excited about. Most importantly, through this process, we give everyone in the company ownership. After every team has had its ideation session, product managers then proceed to gather the top ideas from each of them. A nice outcome of framing the ideation session around customer problems is that we'll often see the same stuff 
coming from different teams and departments, which also means less stuff to prioritize, which for a product manager is awesome. By this time, we have a backlog of feature ideas to solve customer problems, which will help the company reach its business targets. Some of the tools you might use, here, as you see, uh, mostly analog. Time to decide. The prioritization of features happens in a spreadsheet, which you can't see because uh, it's too big, <laughs> uh, with a tab for each leakage point. In each tab is a backlog of feature ideas solving customer problems responsible for drop-off points affecting our top KPIs for that quarter. Features are then ranked from top to bottom by their RICE score, which is a score for each feature calculated the RICE scoring formula from the people at Intercom. Who here has used the RICE score before? Quick show of hands. Good. Who would use it again? All right, that's pretty, much, that's pretty good. <laughs> so the RICE score is an evolved impact effort analysis, which makes a lot of sense. It factors in the uncertainty inherent in impact and effort estimates by adding a confidence weight. It also avoids, it avoids bias towards features you'd use yourself by estimating how many people each project will affect thanks to the reach factor. You can find a template spreadsheet on their blog. The nice thing about Rice is that it really prevents a lot of the highest paid person's opinion or loudest shouting person's opinion syndrome. We all suffer from the effect heuristic. Things we like seem less risky and things we don't seem more risky. The best way to find against personal biases in complex judgments is to trust formulas over intuition. Of course, we are aware that there are lots of unknowns in this formula. But life is complex, and we are better guided by an equally imperfect rank list than by pure opinions or gut feeling. Back to our very own roadmap, through ideation sessions, we had identified solutions to the previously mentioned customer problems underlying a paywall conversion leakages. One of them, for instance, was direct career billing, which allows users to pay for in-app products using their phone bill therefore solving the customer problems of users not having credit cards. Another solution, this one solving the I'm not sold on the efficacy of Busu customer problem, was to integrate results from an independent study on Busu carried by researchers at City University in New York, which proved that using Busu for 22 hours was equivalent to one full college semester of Spanish. Finally, decision time has arrived. We know the max three to five KPIs we want to focus on this quarter, ordered by priority, and understand the funnel bottlenecks in each. We know which customer problems most impact those KPIs, and we have a solid ranked list of feature ideas of how to solve these issues. Now, we get together and select the features that we believe will have the biggest impact. It will still be a passionate discussion, but much more educated and less painful than it used to be. Important detail, we only select features for the first six weeks of the quarter. Why? because it's impossible to accurately forecast what's going to happen in a fast-moving startup three months from now. Second reason is that in the past, we ticked off a quarterly feature list without necessarily hitting our targets. Now, we reassess the situation mid-quarter, check our numbers, analyze impact of what we've launched. We then look back on the solutions backlog and decide on the features following the same logic described previously for the second half of the quarter. Now, our roadmap focuses on problem first, then features, aligns solutions with customer problems and business objectives, aligns teams and stakeholders, is decided based on the formula and data, and is flexible and changes during the quarter. There's still way to go, and our process will most definitely change as the company grows and the organizational structure changes. However, while we might change some of the activities we carry, the guiding principles behind our current process will remain. Observe, understand, ideate, decide. Where do we have a problem? Why do we have a problem? How should we solve the problem? These are simple guiding principles which anyone can take back to their own kitchen and use to make their own recipes, which makes sense in the context of their company and their product. We have no doubt you'll be cooking something awesome, and we're very excited to taste it. Thank you.